Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, convene the uh, Atlantic Herring section. Uh, w welcome everyone back to Alexandria. I want to start off with two announcements. Uh, the first uh, is um, a, a big congratulations to Tony uh, on, on, on yesterday's triathlon. She, she, she scored. So, uh, congrats. And the, and the second is uh, uh, concerning the state of New York of playing musical chairs with their, with their members. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Emerson Hasbrook uh, as, as a new, thank you, uh, as, as a new uh, governor's appointee, and re-welcome Pat Augustine as um, a meeting proxy for Senator Boyle. The cat came back for sure. He wins the fight. So um, uh, we're going to go right into business and pr approval of the agenda. Are there any other issues to add to today's agenda? Seeing none, consider the agenda approved. Uh, approval of the proceedings from February 2014. Are there any, any edits, changes? Seeing none, consider the uh, proceedings approved. We're going to go directly into public comment for items that are not on, on uh, today's agenda. Are there anyone from the public who would like to address? Concerning Elena Caring? Okay. Okay, seeing none, then we're going to go directly on to the update on um, uh, the New England Council's framework for uh, taking away Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I will now provide a, a review of the framework for alternatives adopted by the Council during its meeting on April 22nd and 23rd. So Framework 4 was developed to address a disapproved measures from Amendment 5. Um, this is the dealer weighing reporting requirements and net slippage. So for dealer weighing and reporting, um, the Council selected Alternative 2, Option C. Fish holds on limited access herring vessels are required to be empty before leaving the dock when declared into the, fishing, the herring fishery. Um, a waiver may be issued for instances when there are fish in the hold after inspection by an appropriate law enforcement officer. And this alternative would only apply to category A and B permits. The, the, the intent is for waivers to be issued for refrigeration failure and non-marketable reported fish. The council also adopted alternative Alternative 3 for third-party catch verification to apply to limited access herring vessels that store herring in fish holds. So vessels are required to certify capacity of the fish hold and provide this information to NIMS. Vessels retain customized measuring stick, uh, which is weighted on board. And then a NIMS-approved observer would dip the stick at the first point of landing to estimate the weight of total catch on board for volumetric conversion for pounds of Atlantic herring. For slippage, the council selected alternative four, move along miles away option. So a vessel would have to move 15 nautical miles for the remainder of its trip for slippage due to safety, me mechanical failure, and spiny dogfish. The council also approved option B for trip termination for all other observed slippage events to category A and B permits. Um, for clarification, gear damage would also be part of mechanical failure. The council decided that catch not bought on board due to falling out or off of gear would be would not be subject to additional slippage measures. Um, and also a vessel owner must submit a notification of slippage events via the vessel monitoring system. This requirement would facilitate, facilitate enforcement of category A and B vessels. So this concludes my overview of the council's adopted alternatives for framework four. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melissa. Any qu questions? Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, great report, as always, Melissa. Um, when you said um, um, that a vessel could leave uh, with herring in the hold if it was non-marketable, was it, do you know if there was a definition of what non-marketable meant? In other words, if they just didn't get the price they wanted or... Um, Um, I think it could be price or also if they harvest it too much. Our turn. Uh, turn to the chairman of the hearing uh, co uh, committee, Doug. Uh, the answer is no. There's no definition of what non-marketable was. Um, it was 
but the the intent of the, of of it was that it was r r um, specific to to uh, unique problems such as RSW failures. Jeff. I think the issue there, Richie, was that um, you know if if you have a, a, a RSW failure and your and the product is is you know uh, not avail not able to be sold because of the quality of it, and there's really very limited opportunities to put that stuff in landfills anymore. So there would be an opportunity for a vessel owner to demonstrate that uh, the, the product was poor quality and, and needed to be dumped at sea. And that would be the only uh, exception, I think, as it went down. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how would, now that was approved apparently by the council as a final Thing, it goes now to NIMS. Is that how that works? That's correct. Okay, now in our uh, amendment, don't we have uh, an, uh, one of the things in the amendment is that the hold must be clear before the boat sails again? Isn't that in our amendment? And, and that's our next agenda item? I know, but I mean, um, isn't that contradictory? Um, one of the questions that, as you see, that came from the PDT is what do we do about uh, uh, unique situations such as uh, RSW failures? And um, so we'll have that. We'll have to discuss we'll have that, that discussion. And, and as soon as we're, we're uh, um, Melissa's done with her, with her presentation. Okay, thank you. Are there, are, there, are there any other questions about framework four? Seeing none, um, we're on to the PID, Melissa. Almost. And AP Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So now I will review the draft public information document for Amendment 3. So in February 2014, the section initiated an amendment for the four issues. These are spawning area efficacy in Area 1A, fixed gear set aside, gear declaration, and empty fish hold provision. So first uh, is the timeline um, for development of the amendment. So the plan development team has drafted the public information document for the section's consideration for public comment. Um, and then at the bottom, uh, the earliest in which Amendment 3 may be implemented is February 2015. Okay, first, uh, a few corrections to the draft PID. On page four, it should say um, the start of a season under uh, management issues. And then on page 13, that table should be table two. So the first issue is spawning area efficacy. Currently, there are three spawning areas in management area 1A, which is inshore Gulf of Maine. The FMP requires a minimum of two, two 100 fish samples for two length categories, but a specified dates for each area. A closure begins one week after a significant amount of spawning herring is detected in each spawning area. And if sufficient samples are not available, then an area will close on its default closure date, with the closure to last four weeks. So in recent years, the analysis of commercial samples suggests the sea herring may be experiencing different patterns of spawning activity than expected. In the eastern main spawning area, no spawning herring were encountered by the main Department of Marine Resources. There was sufficient sampling, but only juveniles and non-mature adults were de detected. 
So the, this area was eventually closed approximately two weeks after the default date. In the Massachusetts, New Hampshire area, anecdotal information suggested that there may be disparity in the spawning season of fish collected from the northern portion, portion of this area versus the southern portion. So the plan development team looked into this issue uh, with the Massachusetts, New Hampshire uh, spawning area. It reviewed the gonadosomatic index, uh, GSI data from Massachusetts and Maine DMR sampling programs. So both programs track each other well and the combined data set is well suited to continue to inform the Massachusetts, New Hampshire spawning closure. The PDD finds that the current spawning area boundary for Massachusetts and New Hampshire area to be adequate and further sub areas are not warranted at this time. However, it does recommend extending the spawning closure by at least two weeks in the Massachusetts, New Hampshire area. And this is due to a gear bias um, in the spawning area's vertical stratification. So this diagram illustrates the vertical distribution of sea herring during spawning. The active spawning layer occurs near the bottom in the black, um, while the spent fish are towards the top of the water column. Since spawning analysis is based on commercial samples primarily caught by the midwater trawl and purse seines, there is a gear bias towards the non-spawning fish. Therefore, the PDT believes that a longer closure period of by two weeks may be warranted to protect spawning fish. So the management questions in the PID are, are the existing spawning closure dates appropriate for protecting spawning herring? Is the default four week clo spawning closure sufficient to protect spawning herring? If spawning herring is not detected with sufficient sampling, should there be a closure? And is commercial sampling sufficient for spawning analysis? The second issue is fixed gear set aside provision. Amendment 2 established 500 metric tons uh, set aside in the Area 1A's total allowable catch um, for fixed gear fisheries operating west of Cutler. This set aside is available to fixed gear fishermen in Area 1A until November 1. After then, any unused set aside will be made available to the remainder of the herring fleet in Area 1A until the directed fishery closes. So, statement of the problem. Um, fixed gear fishermen have requested that the unused fixed gear rollover uh, set aside would not be rolled into, into the Area 1A subquota on November 1, and that is because they expect a demand for bait in the lobster fishery through the end of the calendar year. So, the plant development team um, noted that uh, fixed Historically, the sea herring migrate off the coast of Maine by November, so they're not available um, in November and December. Uh, fixed gear landings have not fully utilized the set aside in the past 10 years. Um, in fact, there have been no landings after November 1 since 1993. If fixed gear set aside is exceeded, um, then they can still access uh, the total area 1A sub quota. Uh, so at this time, uh, the PDT finds that there is no biological basis for or against adjusting this fixed gear set aside provision. Uh, the PDT also wants to note that if adjusted, the state and federal rules would be inconsistent. So the management questions are, should portions of the fixed gear set aside that are not harvested by November 1 be made available to all fishing fleets in Area 1A for the remainder of the calendar year? And also, uh, should the Atlantic Herring se section decide on whether the fixed gear set aside will be available to the one Area 1A subquota during the specifications process each year. Moving on to the third issue, uh, gear declaration. So the proposed measure would be to require vessel owners to declare their intended fishing gear prior to the beginning of the season. So the management measure would, uh, oh, so having knowledge about fishing effort, uh, for example, the number of vessels and which gear uh, in advance of a fishing season may improve on projections and allow managers to set appropriate regulations to meet the needs of industry throughout the season and reduce the likelihood of an early closure. It can also provide an incentive for fishermen to plan fishing activities prior to the start of each year. So the plan development team uh, discussed the feasibility and benefits of clear gear de declaration and concluded that a requirement to declare um, gear in advance of fishing, fishing season is not recommended at this time. First, a system by each state would have to be set to collect 
uh, information by either the states nor fisheries or both on intended fishing effort and enforced compliance. There must also be considerations for fishermen who may wish to fish with multiple gears or in multiple areas. Uh, furthermore, the PDT does not believe this information is necessary to make projections for harvest control measures such as days out, when managers traditionally hold a public hearing to collect industry input before the season, and they have the ability to call additional meetings to adjust the harvest control measures to respond to the fishery performance and needs. Um, in order for this information to be useful for projections, um, vessels will have to declare a specific gear type and area well in advance of each trimester with no allowance for modifications in the declaration. Vessels are already reporting the area and gear type through the IVR or VMS systems for each trip. And with the annual variation in adjusted catch rates based on weather and fish availability, availability there is no guaranteed declarations um, will make uh, the projections any more or less accurate. So the management questions are, should there be a requirement for vessel owners to declare their intended fishing gear in advance of a quota period? When and how will vessel owners declare their intended gear? Who will enforce compliance to the gear declarations? What happens when vessel owners decide to change their gear of choice before the trip? And will vessel owners be able to declare more than one gear and area? So the fourth issue um, is a requirement to, for vessel owners to empty the hold of fish prior to departing for a trip. And this is the one that uh, the council has selected in its framework for. Um, so the background information, uh, this measure is intended to address concerns about the discard of unsold herring at sea. Um, and it is also in, intended to discourage dumping of unsold herring that may result from lower sales than expected and avoid mixing of fish from multiple trips. So um, this is from the industry, uh, that there is concern that fish from multiple trips can be mixed if the holes are not completely emptied. And this has the potential to compromise landings used to inform harvest control measures and bycatch avoidance programs. Furthermore, leaving fish in the vessel's hold prevents uh, port size samplers from observing the entirety of the trip, which hinders the operation of bycatch monitoring and avoidance programs. So in this framework adjustment for the New England Fishery Management Council approved the requirement for vessel holes to be empty of fish prior to leaving for a dock. And this includes a waiver which may be issued for instances when there are fish in the holds after inspection by an appropriate law enforcement officer. This alternative um, applies to category A and B boats and is intended for refrigeration failure and non-marketable reported fish. So the plan development team uh, recognizes that fishermen may have surplus catch that cannot be sold and is a challenge to dispose of. Um, the proposed requirement to empty vessel holds of fish may be an incentive to curb wasteful fishing practices and harvest more efficiently to meet market demands. Um, th this provision could eliminate the practice of keeping fish in a hole from one trip to another, which would mix uh, the catch from multiple trips. Um, but the PDT does note that there needs to be considerations for enforcement, unforeseen events that make it impossible to sell fish and vessels that land at multiple ports. So the management questions are, should vessels fish hold be empty prior to departure for an Atlantic herring fishing trip? What are the enforcement considerations? What considerations should be made for unforeseen circumstances that hinder or prevent sales of the fish, such as uh, refrigeration failure and non-marketable reported fish? Uh, finally, there's a, uh, one last question for other issues. Uh, this is to provide an opportunity for members of the public to suggest additional issues for consideration in this ad amendment. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melissa, for your usual succinct and, and, and interesting report. Um, before we go into questions and discussion, I do want to frame the, the discussion by, by noting that the consideration uh, of these issues were as a result of a request from, from Maine industry members and, and uh, both harvesters and dealers. Um, I do have one question, Mo Melissa, before I open it up to the section, and that is on... Um, page 14 of, of the draft document and and, and it, um, just for, for my clarification and that of the other section members you're, you're, we're talking about the efficacy of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, spawning areas and the statement of the problem 
uh, then we go into considerations of the plan development team. So are we the considerations of the plan development team specific to to the uh, New Hampshire uh, mass closure only, or or is it for all th uh, three three spawning areas? Um, at this time, the PDT has only reviewed uh, the Massachusetts New Hampshire area. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Uh, it's a it's a good document. However, uh, I need to clarify plan development team critique of the different issues that uh, we may decide to bring forward in this amendment, since it seems I think the industry would find it difficult to understand if we propose something, if we put it out as a PID with a plan development team saying um, there's no problem. Uh, it's hard to reconcile that. It's a bit embarrassing. So I need to make sure I understand and the section needs to understand where do we have possible inconsistencies, meaning we're going to ask for comment on some issues, some potential strategy, but the plan development team has already told us there's no problem. It's, it's, it's odd. So. Uh, let's walk it. I'll, I'm going to walk, go through this, and I, I'd like you to tell me where um, where the plan development team has said, "Don't bother." Uh, on the spawning area efficacy, on page 10 of the document, considerations of the plan development team, it seems to indicate that the plan development team is saying that there really is no issue with regard to the New Hampshire and Massachusetts spawning closure. If that's the, so is that, is that the case? Um, the PDT finds that there was no issues with the boundaries, but um, it recommends extending the closure by two weeks. Okay. Uh, so there, the issue is um, with sampling being able to actually detect where the spawning fish are since um, the spawning layer is located on the bottom and uh, pursing and midwater trawls tend to fish n near the middle or top of the water column. Okay, good. That's an important point and I'm glad you emphasized that. Uh, frankly, that figure that you showed was very instructive regarding the, you know, the different uh, locations within the water column where the fish in different spawning condition can be found. So, all right, so an extension of the spawning closure, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, that's one of the one of the suggestions the plant development team is offering up. On the fixed gear set aside on page 12, it seems to indicate that we need not address that. It really isn't an issue, and I'm looking at the uh, end of the first paragraph under considerations by the plan development team, and then uh, the second short paragraph after that. So has the plan development team concluded that it really isn't an issue? We, we, they're recommending we don't address it? Okay. Um, the recommendation was that it biologically, it's either way is fine. There's no biological basis one way or the other. Uh, this, I believe, was industry driven. So whether they may be social, economic, political reasons for it, we're not sure. But as far as biologically, we're neutral. Um, there's no, there's no positive one way or the other biologically. Okay. So uh, it still is an issue that um, we should bring to public hearing. All right, then on the, the gear declaration, once again, um, the plan development team is indicating, this is on the bottom of page 13, that we really don't need a gear declaration in order for us to make projections for harvest control measures. Is that what the plan development team uh, is saying? And if that's the case, is the plan development team recommending we don't move forward with a gear declaration? Renee? So this was discussed, um, and the consensus is that due to the nature, just to be, I guess, wary about it, because in order for us to have it, in order for it to help us do our projections, 
in order to better inform the setting of days out, that type of thing. It has to be done in an inflexible way. It would have to be set before the trimester. It would have to be fixed. A vessel would have to declare, and they would have no leeway to change that declaration for the area and the gear. And that would be the only way it could potentially help. But given the, the variation in catch rates and weather, fish availability, there's no guarantee that that would happen. And because we can see the vessels come through, they have to report daily anyway on IVR and VMS. And the managers have the ability to react quickly to it. That was where all, that, all those comments came from, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the empty fish hole provision, it doesn't seem as if the PDT has any objections to that. There are no, no concerns raised by the plan development team on that issue, correct? All right, I'm, uh, I'm fine, Mr. Chairman. So, I think uh, David concluded that he, he, he didn't need... Uh, no, I know. Oh, okay, Renee, can you, can you repeat? The uh, fish hold? Yes. The lack of response? There, there was no objection to that, no. Doug? Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Uh, I, was, I had a, was a little bit curious about the, uh, um, the uh, recommendation uh, that there may be a gear bias going on here. Is, is this to say that when we take biological uh, or spawning samples that purse saners and midwater trawls are not, uh, 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 there's no spawning uh, fish being found in those samples, that all those positives where they, they met the uh, spawning trigger came from all from bottom trawls? Renee? Uh, GSI samples were collected from all, all gear types in the herring fishery. And in fact, there's a figure that's not shown where you can see uh, post closure there are spawning samples collected from midwater trawls in that figure. Just a follow up. And so the issue here is that um, you're trying to say that there may, because of the fact that they're midwater, both, the, both of those gears are pelagic gears. Um, that they may not um, collect spawning fish quite as readily as a bottom trawl, trawl fisherman. And so some of the samples at the end of the spawning, after we've come off the spawning period, um, uh, uh, may not, because bottom trawlers aren't generally fishing in October and November up in Area 1A, and our only source of samples is primarily midwater trawl that they're not they may not always catch the spawning that's that's uh, going on at that period of time right there is a there is a statement made that there were potential gear biases just the way that the the herring stack up in the water column and that sampling can't always happen from all all stages of water Pat. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good report. Uh, has the advisory panel or anyone from the advisory panel weighed in on any of the comments at this early stage? Uh, no, at this point, just the plan development team. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know this is only a PID, which falls, goes to an amendment. But I do see that there's going to be on the gear declaration, the questions, management questions, were good questions because, boy, um, I, can, I can hear it now. You mean I can go in, but I can't go in, I have to declare, but what if I change my mind and all this type of stuff is going to happen. Uh, I suppose, you know, it's all right going to the PID stage with this, but um, I just caution and I have concerns about this part about declaration and if you look at the four management questions, I think they're very good questions to, um, that we, we really need to look hard at. Thank you. Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, to follow up on what Bill is saying, um, I know we always struggle uh, with the days out in our days out meeting. 
um, trying to figure out what uh, boats are going to be and what type of fishery so we can project going forward. But um, to date, uh, it hasn't caused us a problem. We're always concerned that it might, uh, but so far it hasn't. So um, I guess I would uh, have some concern as Bill that you know, we may be creating something that uh, we don't need yet. Thanks. Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the fixed gear set aside, if that wasn't rolled into the, the sub quota on November 1st and it was, what would happen to any, and it wasn't you, and say some of it was used, but it all wasn't used by the end of the year, would it get rolled into the following year's quota, carried over into the following year, or is that something that's not decided yet? Should the section decide to include that in the PID document, that's what we would be seeking comments on. Jeff. Um. There you go. Thank you for the op opportunity to comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, on that issue, um, the federal plan on, only allows a, uh, a sub-area rollover of 10 percent. So wouldn't the federal restriction become operative? In other words, if you didn't use the 295 tons, you'd only could roll over 29 tons under the federal plan. I think the fishermen would love to see uh, the, the section allow all of it to be rolled over um, if it's not used, but my, uh, I, my question is, uh, wouldn't the federal plan be operative and limit the rollover to 10 percent? You may, answer, you may answer that one, Melissa. Um, it's important to remember that the set aside is not a quota, so yeah. I think the, um, I mean the the input from the industry is, and I note it oh well in, in the document here. They're talking about traditional landings and traditional fisheries. We are seeing a um, uh, number of changes, and 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 perhaps there's um, that was a request from the industry to to look at what changes are we seeing from climate that may be having. Uh, uh, fish closer to the shore in, uh, in northern New England during that time of the year. Doug. The, from what I understand is the rollover applies to the sub-ACLs and not to the set-aside. And so if they don't, if it would uh, be based primarily on whether the overall sub-ACL was, be was below it. And then, so the set-aside is really irrelevant to, to what the rollover is right now. Um, it would be next year, like we had an underage back in 2012. We've had, uh, I forget how many metric tons that were rolled over into 2014 for 1A this year, which would make things more available for the whole fishery as a whole. Jeff. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we haven't had a chance to discuss this in AP, but I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it. So in other words, the set aside, if it wasn't utilized and the fishery had closed, everybody was out of there that would add to the potential underage for the following fishing year based on wherever the ACL ends up then. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Pat? Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to move that we approve, the board approve, the PID as presented today with any changes that were noted. Motion made by Mr. Augustine. Is there a second? Second by Bill Adler. Is there any discussion? Bill. Uh, the last section of the PID had a section about uh, any other issues to be brought and put on the uh, put on the uh, PID. And I didn't know if had anybody mentioned anything addition or just go with what we got here. No, I haven't heard any additions. I think we're you know we're opening this up for public comment. Any 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 further comments? Comments from the audience, Ray.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Ray Kane, commercial fisherman, fishing vessel frenzy. Ms. Yun, if you could go over, I believe, uh, your last statement on this PID is something acknowledging the public comment period. It was the very last statement. Uh, are you talking about the question on other issues? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, the final question in the public information document um, just asks uh, for any additional issues that the public would like to suggest for, the, for consideration in the amendment. Thank you. As you all know, I've sat in this audience for years, both here and in the New England Council. And being part of the public, I would hope that this PID is transparent, thoughtful, and comprehensive. It's a document going to the public. They have to be able to understand this. I have issues about observer programs, discrepancies in numbers, and how this relates to this commission is with river herring and sea herring. And my final comment will be, I see uh, bullet number six. I'm just curious as to why we started discussing uh, Nantucket Shoals and George's Bank in August 2012. How come this cannot be rolled into this amendment? Thank you. Yep. Hold that thought to the public comment period. Thank you, Chairman. Any other comments from the audience? Seeing none, back, back to the section. David. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to highlight a point that uh, was just made by Ray Kane. Um, it's not in the amendment. I suspect it should not be in the amendment. It might be an issue more appropriately addressed by the River Herring Board. Uh, and I'll, I'll highlight the reason why. Um, the sea herring fishery is sampled at sea by the Federal Observer Program, and it is also sampled uh, at portside by the Division of Marine Fisheries and, uh, and Maine DMR. And fairly recently, there was one trip of uh, herring that was landed in New Bedford where uh, we estimated, my staff estimated, that from the sampling of the catch uh, dockside, that approximately 145,000 pounds of haddock was landed. So that obviously was of great concern because we have a haddock bycatch cap. And I understand, of course, this section, the SMFC, does not deal with haddock. However, we do deal with river herring. The observer indicated that on that particular trip, about 45,000 pounds was landed. So that's a huge discrepancy between what an observer reported versus what was found after the catch was sampled portside. It's understandable. Many more samples are taken portside port than at sea. So I, I raise this in the context of uh, river herring bycatch, and that if indeed there can be such a great discrepancy in observer record of what was caught versus what was landed for something like haddock, it's quite easy to uh, discern from a, from a herring. Uh, I, I wonder about the, the ability of uh, the board to actually know what is being caught and landed by sea herring vessels uh, when they're, um, what, how much river herring actually is being, being landed. So I don't have a motion to make, but I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that uh, this issue could be Remanded to the Sea Herring to the River Herring Board for uh, further um, further review. Uh, I'll make uh, what information I have available. I'll make it available to uh, the River Herring Board and ASMFC staff. And I believe we have to involve the National Marine Fisheries Service as well, since uh, this has implications. Like I said, it's not something for the amendment, but it is an issue that we need to address, especially since the public is uh, becoming increasingly aware of it, and uh, you know, Ray Kane, of course, uh, made, a, made a point of it. So, And I would also suggest that you make the information available to the MID. The uh, Shadow and River Herring Committee is going to meet at, their, at the upcoming meeting in New Jersey. 
Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And when uh, Amendment 5 to the, uh, uh, the uh, hearing plan was being developed, there was uh, an analysis done by the PDT that compared um, dockside sampling to at sea sampling. And while uh, some of them did line up, there were many that were, uh, there was some discrepancies between some at sea observer and um, uh, dockside sampling. So there's other information that we can, that's already been uh, developed that could be brought into bear here, but it was one of the things where I think um, uh, we struggled with ourselves because we were hoping to find out which one estimated it the best. And we didn't come to a good conclusion on that. But other than that, I think you do take more samples at dockside than uh, at sea. So that may point to where your uh, more uh, precise estimates or accurate estimates might be coming from. Are there any final comments or questions? Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question um, on the um, timeline on, on page one. Um, there is no mention of uh, an AP review. I assume that that would take place uh, between now and July, the end of July and before the August board meeting. I would like to see um, the AP uh, review specifically mentioned in that box, if that's possible. Melissa? Thank you. Sure, I can definitely put that in. Mm -hmm. But the uh, AP and the TC will get a chance to comment on the amendment. Thank you. Are there any final comments? Seeing none, uh, uh, want me to read it? Okay. Um, it's, it, uh, it, 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 are there any objections to the motion on the board? Seeing none, consider the move to approve the PID with the changes made today approved. Um, thank you, everyone, for some constructive dialogue. We're on to agenda item number six, an update on the Georgia uh, Nantucket Shoal study. Um, turn this over to Tony. This was an agenda issue at the NRCC meeting several weeks ago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the hearing section had asked the policy board to send a letter to the New England Fishery Management Council, uh, NOAA, as well as the Northeast Fishery Science Center regarding the Nantucket Shoals um, spawning study that the TC had put together a overview budget and program for. And so we brought it up at the NRCC meeting. And those of you that are not familiar with NRCC, it's an um, it's so the coordinating council that gets together with the commission, the New England Fishery Management Council, the Mid-Atlantic Council, the GARFO, as well as the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And we brought up the spawning study to see if there was a way that we could coordinate and come up with funds for the project. Um, currently, what we are going to do is have the Northeast Fisheries Science Center read over the TC's proposal for a study. They are going to see if there's any additional um, sampling that can be done in the current sampling programs that are going on through the um, Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And then um, also see if there's any, have any additional suggestions to the study and get back to the commission prior to our August meeting. And so we'll have a, a more thorough report on their suggestions for the study, um, what additional um, observers or um, additional sampling that can go on and then get back to the section and then we can go forward with a plan from there. So report out from NRCC um, at the August section meeting. And I would only add that the uh, NRCC was provided with a complete copy of the correspondence and the work that, that was generated by RTC. Questions for Tony? Uh, Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tony, thank you for your follow through on that and um, for uh, pursuing those uh, those steps. I saw in the packet of materials that there was a letter sent to the um, uh, to the New England Council. Have we received a response from them, or would that response have been encapsulated with what happened at the um, NRCC Coordinating Committee meeting? Tony. 
I believe that response would be encapsulated with the coordinating committee. We sent them the letter to let them know that we were going to be bringing up the issue at the coordinating council meeting just to give them a heads up so they wouldn't be surprised. Sarah. Thank you very much. I'll wait uh, till August for the uh, for the next installment, the next chapter in this book. Um, Tony and I had a conversation before the the meeting earlier today, and of course, it seems like what all this boils down to is finding the funding to make it happen. And I don't know what rocks we can turn over to find some funding. I have to say, uh, since our conversation this morning, I've had the the little musical ditty running through my head: uh, "Money makes the world go around." In this case, I think money makes the research go around. So uh, we'll continue to pursue that. And again, um, thank you for your consideration and efforts. Any other questions for Tony? Before we go out of business, uh, um, I guess I want to check in with uh, David and Doug. You, uh, because it's um, PIDs uh, 1A specific, you, you're interested in public hearing? Okay, so uh, we'll, well, the three of us will work with, with Melissa offline, set up the dates, and we can get, get them published. Uh, is there any other business to come before the hearing section today? David? Well, not so much other business, but um, I wanted to point out that with regards to the concern that uh, Sarah has expressed, and we have echoed it in the letter that was sent to Tom Meese about the importance to protect George's Bank herring during the spawning season. I mentioned earlier on the catch of haddock. Uh, maybe it's an anomaly, maybe not. Uh, differences in Etsy versus port sampling. Um, there is a lot of haddock out there on George's Bank, and the speed bear is watching in that uh, it's, it's possible that the George's Bank haddock cap might be caught relatively early this year, May 1 being the start of the season, and that would mean we'd have a de facto spawning closure. So, uh, again, it bears watching. Hopefully uh, the boats, the midwater troll boats, the other boats are, are able to avoid the haddock so the cap is not taken, but uh, it very well could happen. Follow up, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to make a comment um, about that particular incident. And it was, um, there's a new um, uh, uh, operation in the fishery, and one particular individual who was operating in a way that's not uh, traditional in, in the fishery. And uh, uh, that, that guy, he's going to the Azores <laughs> to run one of those boats, and we're happy to see him go, frankly. So. Any final comments? Seeing none, uh, the herring section is adjourned.